The long road hurried to nowhere and had no end. It ran through villages and small towns, flat country and mountains, stony barrens and meadows springing out of stones, but it belonged to none of these, and it never rested anywhere. It rushed the unicorn along, tugging at her feet like the tide, fretting at her, never letting her be quiet and listen to the air as she was used to doing. Her eyes were always full of dust, and her mane was stiff and heavy with dirt. Time had always passed her by in the forest, but now it was she who passed through time as she traveled. The colors of the trees changed, and the animals along the way grew heavy coats and lost them again. The clouds crept or hurried before the changing winds, and were pink and gold in the sun, or livid with storm. Wherever she went, she searched for her people, but she found no trace of them, and in all the tongues she heard spoken along the road, there was not even a word for them any more. Early one morning, about to turn off the road to sleep, she saw a man hoeing in his garden. Knowing that she should hide, she stood still any ways and watched him work, until he straightened and saw her. He was fat, and his cheeks jumped with every step he took. Oh, he said, oh, you're beautiful. When he tugged off his belt and made a loop in it, and moved clumsily towards her, the unicorn was my more pleased than frightened. The man knew what she was, and what he himself was for, to hoe turnips and pursue something that shone and could move faster than he could. She sidestepped his first lunge as lightly as though the wind of it had blown her out of his reach. I have been hunted with bells and banners in my time, she told him. Men knew that the only way to hunt me was to make the chase so wondrous that I would come near to see it, and even so I was never once captured. My foot must have slipped, said the man. Steady now, you pretty thing. I never really understood, the unicorn mused as the man picked himself up. What do you dream of doing with me once you've caught me? The man leaped again, and she slipped away from him like the rain. "'I don't think you know yourselves,' she said. "'Ah, steady, steady, easy now.' The man's sweating face was stripped with dirt, and he could hardly get his breath. "'Pretty,' he gasped, "'you pretty little mare!' "'Mare!' The unicorn trumpeted the word so shrilly that the man stopped pursuing her and clapped his hands to his ears. "'Mare!' she demanded. "'I, a horse! Is that what you take him for? Is that what you see?' "'Good horse,' the fat man panted. He leaned on the fence and wiped his face. "'Curry you up, clean you off. You'll be the prettiest old mare anywheres.' He reached out with his belt again. "'Take you to the fair,' he said. "'Come on, horse.' "'A horse,' the unicorn said. "'That's what you were trying to capture. A white mare with her mane full of burrs.' As the man approached her, she hooked her horn through the belt, jerked it out of his grasp, and hurled it across the road into a patch of daisies. "'A horse am I,' she snorted. "'A horse, indeed!' And for a moment the man was very close to her, and his and her great eyes stared into his own, which were small and tired and amazed. Then she turned and fled up the road, running so swiftly that those who saw her exclaimed, "'Now there's a horse! There's a real horse!' One man said quietly to his wife, "'That's an Arab horse. I was on a ship with an Arab horse once.' From that time, the unicorn avoided towns, even at night, unless there was no way at all to go around them. Even so, there were a few men who gave chase, but always to a wandering white mare, never in the gay and reverent manner proper to the pursuit of a unicorn. They came with ropes and nets and baits of sugar lumps, and they whistled and called her Bess and Nellie. Sometimes she would slow down enough to let their horses catch her scent, and then watch as the beasts reared and wheeled and ran away with, with their terrified riders. The horses always knew her. How can it be, she wondered. I suppose I could understand it if men had simply forgot unicorns, or if they had changed so that they hated all unicorns now and tried to kill them when they saw them. But not to see them at all, to look at them and see something else? What do they look like to one another, then? What do trees look like to them, or houses, or real horses, or their own children? Sometimes she thought if men no longer knew what they were looking for, there may well be unicorns in the world yet, unknown and glad of it. But she knew, beyond both hope and vanity, that men had changed and the world with them, because the unicorns were gone. Yet she went along the hard road, although each day she wished a little more that she had never left her forest. Then, one afternoon, the butterfly wobbled out of a breeze and lit on the tip of her horn. He was velvet all over, dark and dusty, with golden spots on his wings, and he was as thin as a flower petal. Dancing along her horn, he saluted her with his curling feelers. 
I am a roving gambler. How do you do? The unicorn laughed for the first time in her travels. Butterfly, what are you doing out on such a windy day? She asked him. You'll take cold and die long before your time. Death takes what man would keep, said the butterfly, and leaves what man would lose. Blow, wind, and crack your cheeks. I'll warm my hands before the fire of life and get four-way relief. He glimmered like a scrap of owl light on her horn. Do you know what I am, butterfly? The unicorn asked, hopefully, and he replied, Excellent. Well, you're a fishmonger. You're my everything. You're my sunshine. You're old and gray and full of sleep. You're my pickle-faced consumptive Mary Jane. He paused, fluttering his win wings against the wind, and added conversationally, Your name is a golden bell hung in my heart. I would break my body to pieces to call you once by your name. Say my name, then, the unicorn begged him. If you know my name, tell it to me. Rumpelstiltskin, the butterfly answered happily. Gotcha, you don't get no medal. He jigged and twinkled on her horn, singing, won't you come home, Bill Bailey, won't you come home, where once he could not go, buckle down, win Saki, go and catch a falling star, clay lies still, but bloods are over, so I should be called kill devil all the parish over. His eyes were gleaming scarlet in the glow of the unicorn's horn. She sighed and plodded on, both amused and disappointed. It serves you right, she told herself, you know better than to expect a butterfly to know your name. All they know are songs and poetry and anything else they hear. They mean well, but they can't keep things straight, and why should they? They die so soon. The butterfly swaggered before her eyes, singing one, two, three, oh, Larry, as he whirled, chanting, Not, I'll not carry in comfort, look down that lonesome road, for oh, what damned minutes tell her, o'er oh, what dotes, yet doubts, hasten, mirth, and bring with thee a host of furious fancies, whereof I am commander, which will be on sale for three days only at bargain summer prices. I love you, I love you, oh, the horror, the horror, and a roin to thee, witch, a roin to thee. Indeed, and truly, you've chosen a bad place to be in lane in. Willow, willow, willow. His voice tinkled in the unicorn's head like silver money falling. He travelled with her for the rest of the waning day. But when the sun went down and the sky was full of rosy fish, he flew off her horn and hovered in the air before her. "'I must take the A-train,' he said politely. Against the clouds she could see that, the, that his velvet wings were ribbed with delicate black veins. "'Farewell,' she said. "'I hope you hear many more songs,' which was the best way she could think of to say goodbye to a butterfly. But instead of leaving her, he fluttered above her head looking suddenly less dashing and a little nervous in the blue evening air. "'Fly away,' she urged him. "'It's too cold for you to be out.' But the butterfly still dallied, humming to himself. "'They ride that horse you call the Medo Macedoni,' he intoned absent-mindedly. And then, very clearly, "'Unicorn. Old French, unicorn. Latin, unicornis. Literally, one horned. Unis, one, and cornu, a horn.' a fabulous animal resembling a horse with one horn. Oh, I am a cook and a captain bold and the maid in the Nancy Brig. Has anybody here seen Kelly? He strutted joyously in the air, and the first fireflies blinked around him in wonder and grave doubt. The unicorn was so startled and so happy to hear her name spoken at last that she overlooked the remark about the horse. Oh, you do know me, she cried, and the breath of her delight blew the butterfly twenty feet away. When he came scrambling back to her, she pleaded, "'Butterfly, if you really know who I am, tell me if you've seen anyone like me. Tell me which way I must go to find them. Where have they gone?' "'Butterfly, butterfly, where shall I hide?' he sang in the fading light. "'The sweet and bitter fool will presently appear. Christ, that my love were in my arms and I in my bed again!' He rested on the unicorn's horn once more, and she could feel him trembling. Please, she said, all I want to know is that there are other unicorns somewhere in the world. Butterfly, tell me there are still others like me, and I will believe you and go home to my forest. I have been away so long, and I said that I would come back soon. 